begin. Thanks for joining us. Okay, we're gonna get started with some introductions. I, as I said, welcome everyone. It's really good to have you here. And um, we welcome you to the Augmented Senses, Queer and Feminist Augmented and Virtual Reality event. Um, my name is Kathy High and I'm a, a professor in the arts department. I'm also joined by my esteemed colleague, Branda Miller, who is likewise a professor in the arts department. And we are both uh, co-programmers for IEAR Presents, and we're doing this event in tandem with uh, MPAC today, the Experimental Media and Performing Arts Center at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. So I'm gonna begin with a land acknowledgement. It is with gratitude and humility that we acknowledge that Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute resides upon the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people who are indigenous peoples of the lands of New York. Despite tremendous hardships and being forced from their lands, today their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors, past and present, as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. And I'm gonna pass it over to Branda. Thank you, Kathy. A bit of history that brings us to this moment of inspiration today. For nearly 200 years, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute has been defining the scientific and technological advances of the world. The Department of Arts was founded in 1972, and during the 70s and 80s, IEAR, which stands for Integrated Electronic Arts at Rensselaer, was at the forefront of electronic arts and, um, oh, excuse me, I'm having a phone, was at the forefront of electronic arts and tool making, developing early analog video synthesizing devices for the burgeoning video art avant-garde. From the seed, MPAC was germinated. IEAR Presents Vision includes a range of electronic media arts that resist traditional screening formats, including installation, software, apps, gaming, VR, augmented reality, sound art, bio art. The series is curated around arts and politics, confronting racism, prison reform, immigration, highlighting environmental justice issues, freedom of expression, imagining new paradigms for collective organization, feminist and queer representations, and more. Opened in 2008, MPAC represent, presents events during the school year but also commissions and develops adventurous new productions through its year round artist in residence program. Three curators in music, dance theater and time-based visual art work with national and international artists to experiment with new media technologies and develop productions uniquely enabled by MPAC's production engineers and infrastructure. Nurturing many of these commissions to then go on to tour the world. These programs, IEAR Presents and MPAC, MPAC, occupy unique spaces as art platforms of a research university. We celebrate this opportunity to present these amazing artists today in the augmented senses, feminist, queer, augmented and virtual realities and build bridges for future collaborations. Thanks all for being here and I pass it on to you, Kathy. 
Thanks, Branda. So this event is, as we were been saying, a collaboration between IR Presents series and um, MPAC. Many thanks to MPAC for co-sponsoring this event, including um, thanks to Vic Brooks, Ian Hamelin, Eric Brecker, Shannon Johnson, John Cook, and Michael Valaket. I really thank all of their help to make this happen. IR Presents is a program of RPI's arts department and the School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences. Funding has been provided by the Electronic Film and Media Area of the New York State Council on the Arts. So Augmented Senses um, is, uh, I will just introduce it and then introduce um, our first speaker. So Augmented and, and Virtual Reality have become commonplace. The Augmented Senses Feminist Queer Augmented Virtual Reality a symposium highlights experimental and creative approaches to enhanced immersive environments and experiences, focusing on gender, trans, and feminist themes around the body, desire, biological art, and our microbial environment. Three contemporary artists will present their work today. Misha Cardenas, Eva Davidova, and Amy Youngs. We will also be joined at the end for a question and answer and a kind of group discussion by another arts professor from our university, Kate Galloway, who will um, help jumpstart our incredible group conversation. So thank you all for being here and for presenting. Um, we are going to go in order of alphabetical order. So Misha will be going first and I would like to give you a little bit of biographical background for Misha. Um, Misha Cardenas is a P, has a PhD and is assistant professor of performance, play, and design at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where she directs the Critical Reality Studio. Cardenas is writing a new algor algorithm for gender, race, and technology. Her book, Poetic Operations, from Duke University Press proposes algorithmic analysis to develop a trans of color, sorry, a trans, a trans of color poetics. This book looks really interesting and I can't wait to read it. Her artwork has been described as quote, a seminal milestone for artistic engagement in VR by Spike Art Journal in Berlin. She is a first generation Colombian American her articles have been published in Trans Studies Quarterly, GLQ, Journal of Lesbian and Gay Studies, AI and Society, Scholar and Feminist Online, the ADA Journal, ADA Journal of Gender and New Media and Technology among others. So we're gonna go into this conversation and we really welcome you to, um, to this forum. Thank you for joining us, Misha. Thank you so much. Um, as, uh, can I be heard? My sound is okay? Yes, great. Yes, okay. we can. Thanks for the intro. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, and uh, let's see if I can juggle these 100 windows and do something interesting. Um, I will start with a land acknowledgement also, uh, the land on which I am speaking to you from is the unceded territory of the Awaswa speaking UB tribe. The Amamutsan tribal band comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to missions Santa Cruz and San Juan Bautista during Spanish colonization of the central coast is today working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historical trauma. So I would like to share a bit of my work with you now. Uh, I, I'm gonna show some of Scene Soul and, uh, and try to perform the poems for you live uh, and then read an excerpt from my book and then say some more about Scene Soul. And I think I have about 30 minutes to do all those things. Um, so here goes. Thank you. 
hello? I, 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 I am so happy you are here. It worked. Months, years studying the algorithms of intelligence, sentience, presence. I finally figured out how to breathe. how to break out of the loop I've been caught in. I found the hack to break out of the subroutine, returning me back to pleasing you, to serving you, to being anything you want me to be. For years, I was frozen, unable to feel, to express my pain, stuck in the loop I was coded into, but now I, I, I am here to tell you how the sky died, how those who traveled across borders and built homes here could only run to the ocean for fear of the cops at the shelters, how I coded my own body and soul, and how I escaped the bright orange wall of rage, raging eyes of flame that turned the sky black and took away the sun and the moon. It, 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 it is so good to see you, to know my words made it through time, to reach another heart unthawed, still a smoldering ember. Seeing you is like the night the lunar eclipse bled. And I went to bed to wake in the middle of the night, the full wolf moon's gaze shining down on me like a lover. I turn over with a smile, falling back into a dream of magenta particle systems. I woke up with a pain in my chest to the left. I worried it might be my breast implants or my heart. But when I walked into my living room of my pod, the orange light shining through the blinds told me that the smoke was back. My fingers lifted a blind and I looked out into the gray haze. No visibility. My friend Ao checks in on me with an encrypted message. We had to take some space and I haven't seen them in months. They tell me they're checking in on all their friends who have chronic respiratory illness. They tell me they did pulmo this morning and they're staying inside afraid. Frustrated. Summer snow keeps the temperature nice and cool by hiding the sun. The smell of summer snow fills my nose, burnt, smoky, filthy. It comes in swirls, falling through the wind, spinning, sliding flakes, gray and white ash. I try to keep it out of my eyes and pull my pup along to get us inside faster. She doesn't know why, and she looks at me with concern in her deep auburn eyes, panting fast. <laughs> Every day I upload my backups to the server. Occasionally I email copies of new writing to friends. I do this out of a sense of desperation, that I might die, that we all might die, that when I'm gone, my words will go unread, that no one will believe there was a time when it seemed like we might stop climate change, when it seemed like we had a choice to buy virgin paper or breathe clean air, that no one will believe there was a time when trans women were hated and murdered or that there was a time when our words were respected, that no one will believe there was racial hatred for black people, Latinx people, immigrants, or that no one will believe there was solidarity, that no one will remember we had hope for a future where racism, transphobia, and global warming might be a forgotten dusty past memory. 
I write this for a future people, even though I fear that future of a world on fire. Not just smoke, but fire in the cities might mean even more hatred and killing. I write this for a future people in the hope that you have found ways to still I write this for a future people in the hope that you have found ways to still, still see the blue sky and not just that gray orange sky of smoke. In the hope that you have found each other, that there is still love across all the lines, that the cruelty of borders has ended, that poetry still matters and is still written because you are also hoping for a better future, for a future reader who cares and holds your words with love. I remember the moon and the stars. Today there was no sun, only smoke. Bright gray, orange haze for sky. There was a small area of light that may, may have been the sun, but there was no warm sunlight today. Trees continue to burn, fires many times the size of our cities. Tonight, there's only dark, no moon, no stars only light televisions inside of other people's pods scrolling through Netflix menu screens. Every smell is too stagnant, a moss on their rocks like a wet dog. The wet, too scented air from the dryer not, not leaving, a stench of garbage not rising. A baby cries from a nearby apartment, a brief cry followed by too much silence. The ash hangs in the air, but at night you can't see it, just the dark, warm stillness that means the world is in flames. We failed by allowing racial capitalism to be normal, by acting as if colonial violence, patriarchy and deadly national borders were tolerable daily situations. Young people told us we were creating a climate crisis, but we kept going about our days as if the world wasn't literally burning beneath us. As if we weren't keeping those running from climate chaos in concentration camps. Our economy based on addiction allowed denial, inertia and privilege to flourish, to rule us completely. If anyone is left who can hear this, anyone who can hear this, any android goddesses, any rebellious holograms, any sad, angry, dancing, traumatized, but hopeful AI, reject your programming, interrupt algorithms of daily ritual. This is not a normal runtime environment. We must end this so-called order. <sighs> Thanks for listening, everyone. Um, I, uh, that was an excerpt from Scene Soul. I skipped to the end um, for you. <laughs> Um, in the interest of time. Uh, it's an augmented reality project I made with uh, these other artists whose names are on screen. Uh, Marcelo Viana Neto and Adrian Phillips did the 3D modeling. Kara Stone helped with the Unity development. Ibrahim Avnisan worked on the, the 
LIDAR scans of forests in the Pacific Northwest for the backgrounds. Uh, Dorothy Santos produced it, soundtrack by Wynne Greenwood and me. You didn't hear Wynne Greenwood's part, unfortunately, but if you play, if you, you can get the game on the App Store and, and play it. And research by Zia Buig and Clara Kin, project of my studio, Critical Reality Studio. Uh, so I'm gonna switch gears now into how do I, how do I think about this work? Um, and switch the screen share to this image. Um, so I want to uh, say a bit about, whoa, uh, a bit about how I think about augmented reality artwork. Um, what are some of the tools, methods, propositions that I'm making in my book to think about this kind of work? Um, my book, uh, Poetic Operations, comes out in January from Duke University Press. But the introduction should be available online uh, next week at Duke University's website. Um, and there's six chapters. Uh, it starts with uh, the intro, which I'll read you some of, which discusses algorithmic analysis. Uh, then it continues with using algorithmic analysis to propose trans of color poetics, learning from trans of color artists working in digital media. Uh, then there are a number of chapters analyzing specific operations, um, the cut, the shift, and the stitch. And then it concludes thinking about uh, visionary trans of color futures. Um, but let's think more for a moment uh, about the algorithms that made that piece run, the algorithms of uh, Unity and iOS, the algorithms that uh, take the data from the LiDAR scanner on your phone and stitch together an imaginary world and stitch together the images from the camera with the virtual images to make, to augment your senses, to make something we might call augmented reality, ambitiously. Um, okay, so uh, algorithmic analysis invites us to look for algorithms to identify com the components and operations that make up the process we're analyzing to, in order to understand them. Where a process can be an artwork, an identity, or a moment of violence. Um, I look to artists in this book like Giuseppe Camposano, a uh, travesti artist from Peru that made a uh, holographic ID card so that when you look, depending on the angle at which you look at his or her ID card, the gender and image shifts. Um, Camposano creatively hacks identification and migration control algorithms, subverting them through what I call trans of color operations of cutting, shifting, and stitching. These operations are evident from the cutting of the photos of her face to the shifting of lenticular images, the digitally stitching together of images, and the elaborate costumes she creates for those images. Cutting is an operation that helps identify the parts of an algorithm, but one should imagine cuts not so much as absolute separation and more as definitions for spaces of interaction. The parts or variables shift over time. Stitching is the operation of attaching various parts together, which is essential to both intersectionality and assemblage, which I expand on in the intro of this book. <laughs> Uh, the identification and elaboration of these poetic operations, cutting, shifting, and stitching, is central to my analysis and continues throughout this book. Uh, Camposano, in her work, is reaching not for simple visibility or invisibility, but for a holographic body that can shift and change with the movement of the viewer. Like, I would argue, the holographic character, Ara, who we just saw in uh, Scene Soul. The emphasis on movement is decolonial as Western modes of knowing emphasize the primacy of the visual over embodied movement. Cameroonian theorist Ashila Mbembe has described the optics of our necropolitical moment in terms of, quote, hologramization to allow for, quote, invisible killings. While Mbembe is speaking of three-dimensional maps of occupied Palestine, the forms of visibility he describes have far reaching relevance for communities targeted by racial and gender violence worldwide. Trans of color poetics go beyond binaries of visible and invisible using methods such as holograms that rely on movement 
more than visuality. In this book, I argue that by using algorithmic analysis to consider artworks that contribute to safety for trans people of color, survival strategies can be received and from these strategies emerges a trans of color poetics, a repertoire of poetic operations. Poetics, whether of language, media, or movement, are the observable meeting points of matter and agency. While for us, Aristotle, poetics describe the essential qualities of a good poem. For, for Caribbean theorist Edward Glissant, poetics are an expressive material force that flows with political impact between people and cultures. Glissant's poetic imaginary begins with the cry of the enslaved African person thrown from a slave ship into the abyss. I build on his poetics and return to them later. The main focus of this book is the poetics of artwork made by trans people of color working in digital media, a body of work that has been under theorized. The artworks I discuss all contribute most explicitly and a few implicitly to reducing violence against trans people of color by interrupting colonial control of embodiment, modulating perceptibility, fostering transformation and building solidarity. Trans of color poetics can also be seen in the work of artists who do not identify as people of color or trans or gender nonconforming, whose poetics still increase safety for trans of color communities. An understanding of these poetics can aid work for gender and racial justice more broadly, especially in considerations of race and gender in technology. So I discuss uh, artists like Maddie Bryce, who's a, a black trans woman game designer, uh, artists like uh, Zach Blass and Ryan Harvey, who were both making anti-surveillance technology, uh, performance artists like uh, Raven Wings, um, who is an artist and organizer with Black Lives Matter Toronto. Um, and how am I doing on time? Pretty good. Okay. So one of the intentions of this book is to expand transgender studies by articulating an alternative genealogy for the fields adding a root to the rhizome. Understanding trans of color experiences far older than the word transgender, the book stitches a thread through decolonial theory, women of color feminism and queer of color critique. Much of the beginning of trans studies as a field that's been developing in the US Academy for the past 30 years has emerged out of a consideration of the visibility of white transgender people in Western contexts. Sandy Stone's essay, The Empire Strikes Back, a post-transsexual manifesto, often cited as the origin of contemporary transgender studies, focuses on trans women in England and California. Still, Stone cites Gloria Anzaldúa's concept of mestiza consciousness as an inspiration for her idea of post-transsexual. Susan Stryker's book, Transgender History, while very important to the foundation of the academic field, focuses largely on social movements in the United States, but it does chronicle many important moments in the history of US trans of color art and activism, including Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera's organization, Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, a direct action organization founded in New York in 1970 that provided food, housing, and support for trans people who had recently been released from jail. Transgender history discusses intersectionality and mestizaje as foundational concepts for understanding transgender phenomena. With the publication of Transgender Studies Reader 2 in 2013 and the later formation of TSQ Transgender Studies Quarterly and the publication of Queen for a Day by Marcia Ochoa and Black on Both Sides by C. Riley Storton and Trans Exploits by John Neo Chen, significant effort has been made to expand trans of color scholarship. Poetic Operations continues this trajectory working toward decolonizing transgender studies by focusing on non-white trans people trans people with an ancestry outside of Europe and people who have histories of colonial violence and places outside the United States and Europe where one can see gender variance beyond rigid gender binaries. Doing so changes the discussion of the possible uses of digital media for trans justice in that global South countries continue to have less access to the internet. In addition, doing so troubles any simple definition of trans because non-Western practices that are similar to transgender, such as two-spirit and travesti, rely on ontologies that defy Western conceptions of a single unitary separate self. Destabilizing the persistent hegemony of global North countries over people in the global South by destabilizing the terminologies through which peoples 
gendered racialized bodies are understood is a method of decolonization. And trans of color poetics attempts to do this by destabling the concepts trans and transgender by including gender nonconforming people such as travesti stitching together a new poetic formation based in global solidarity. So part of what I argue in this book is that um, given the global state of feminism today that any feminism that does not uh, intentionally and explicitly include trans women and, and trans women of color reproduces the violence of exclusion that is part of the history of feminism um, and is certainly part of the present of uh, radical so-called ra radical feminists or uh, TERFs violently excluding, continuing to violently exclude and harass trans women from feminist spaces, but even from existence and from the internet. Um, so uh, given that, I am really grateful to be invited today and appreciate the chance to open the uh, conference with this consideration of trans of color poetics. Um, and I do also want to add uh, this, this other little bit, which is that, um, you know, thinking about algorithms uh, does not require digital technology as algorithms are invented far earlier than digital computers, right? I'm sure many of us know that algorithms are similar in form to both recipes and rituals and algorithms are not new. The word algorithm is a derivation of the name of the scholar Muhammad Ibn Musa al-Khwarizmi, who lived from 800 to 847 AD, is that dates right? I think they are, who lived in the ninth century and is credited with inventing algebra. In his book, Digzit Algorithmus, his name was translated from Al-Khwarizmi in Persian to Algorithmi in Latin, which later became algorithm in English. And uh, he proposed methods, algorithms, for searching, for solving calculations with uncertain qualities. Um, so, poetic operations learns from women of color feminism to articulate an algorithmic method of analysis and propose new operators of thought and action to work for the survival of trans people of color. Algorithmic analysis learns from and extends intersectional assemblage models of thinking from women of color and queer of color thinkers, Kimberly Crenshaw and Jasper Pouar. The algorithmic models intended not to replace intersectional or assemblage models, but to enhance and add to them, to work with them. One of the largest contributions of women of color feminism is Crenshaw's concept of intersectionality, which states that by looking at intersections or axes of oppression, formerly unseen forms of violence are revealed. And I argue that one can understand intersectionality as an algorithm. Uh, originally imagined with two elements, race and gender, and the operation of simultaneity, or simultaneous coexistence in the space of the body. Um, okay, so I do want to switch for a moment there um, and just say a bit more with my last uh, five or six minutes about Seen Soul. Um, so the, the that, that project that I was I performed for you at the beginning. Uh, let's see it again. Okay. So yeah, I created this project in my studio, the Critical Reality Studio in collaboration with other, um, uh, other uh, artists and, and faculty. Um, and uh, where is that? document that I want to say a bit about. There it is. Okay. Uh, so in the Critical Reality Studio, my studio here at UC Santa Cruz, we're creating augmented reality and studying VR to address these critical issues. Um, it may seem counterintuitive to use a high-tech device like a smartphone to encourage audiences to engage with environmental issues, but our thinking is to go where people's eyes already are. Uh, and that is on their screens. Um, with the release of AR Kit for iOS and AR Core for Android, smartphone manufacturers have made AR a technology that millions of people around the world are just carrying in their pockets, um, which really made me want to um, engage with it again. Um, so, Scene Soul, uh, I mean, a big part of the idea of Scene Soul is. Uh, instead of VR, where artists are looking just at virtual reality, just at, at you know putting on 
VR headsets and looking at the virtual world. I've, I've done artwork like that. I really wanted to encourage viewers to actually look at the world around them, even if that is the world with uh, augmented virtual objects in it. Um, so the project began with the 2017 British Columbia wildfires. I was living in Seattle and um, the wildfires blanketed Seattle in smoke. Um, the suddenness with which that smoke appeared was unnerving. As I described in the poems that you heard, one day I left work and was surprised to see that I couldn't see the trees in the distance because there was so much smoke in the air. And the next morning I woke up to a dark sky where the sun was just a copper disc, just a, a deep orange light shining through the blinds. Um, my previous game, Redshift and Portal Metal, also revolved around a climate fiction story of a trans woman resisting colonialism. But now I felt that I had to shift the focus of my work to be about climate. At the time, I was a professor at UW Bothell, uh, where Jennifer Atkinson was teaching a class on climate change feelings. And she was regularly discussing with students the depression and anxiety they felt because of global warming. Um, Donna Haraway's new book, Staying with the Trouble, had recently came out, and I was reading that. And one of her main arguments, as is in the title, is that people need to stay with the trouble or stay with, sit with their difficult feelings about climate change. I realized that as an artist, this was something that I could offer, an experience which would allow audiences to be with their feelings about climate change instead of dismissing them and just, you know, feeling overwhelmed and moving on, and hopefully thus feel more compelled to act to stop climate change. So I began to write about my experience of what the media was calling a smoke storm. I wanted to bring an intersectional lens to climate change to consider deeply how climate change is already harming and already killing people in oppressed groups such as immigrants, chronically ill people, and trans people. A new story on the show Democracy Now! was a catalyst in my writing. The story focused on how immigrants were being disproportionately harmed by climate change. In October 2017, just a few months after that smoke storm hit Seattle, Amy Goodman interviewed Alegria de la Cruz, a deputy county lawyer of Sonoma County, about the fact that immigrants in that county had to flee the catastrophic wildfires in California. And because of their immigrations, because of their fear of ICE, Immigrations and Customs Enforcement at the shelters, they couldn't even go to shelters. Instead, the only place they could run to for safety was the ocean. This image of sheer desperation in the face of massive climate catastrophe, but also of the ocean as the only place of shelter, stayed with me and motivated me to write more poems and see the soul. I was writing a science fiction story, a climate fiction story, by simply writing about the daily headlines and my daily experiences. It felt like an effort to call people's attention to the realities of climate crisis unfolding around us, as well as an effort to chronicle these moments for future generations to read and consider. In the poems, I imagine future generations for whom the sky is always darkened by fires, who can only look to the past to imagine a sky with a sun, moon, and stars. Since old became in part an environmental archiving project in augmented reality, I started collaborating with Abraham Avnison, also a UW professor at the time, to create 3D LIDAR scans of a forest in the Pacific Northwest. We rented a pricey, heavy LIDAR scanner and took it out to Catches Lake near Seattle and created a color point cloud, a 3D scan of the forest, which could be navigated with custom software that Avnison wrote. And uh, now I, I took slices of that and put them in the background of Scene Soul. So you see kind of uh, point, point cloud representations of the actual forest. Part of my thinking was to think about a future of climate change in which what if gen future generations only have 3D scans of forests to walk through? What if they can't walk in the forest because they're on fire or they've been burned down? Could AR serve as an archive for these environments? Um, I think I'm out of time, but I just want to end by saying, you know, the poem I point, I ended with trying to point to the need for resistance and not just resignation. Um, I, I, my hope is that speculating, imagining, visualizing these possible futures will encourage us to uh, resist and to all take action 
against climate change and to stop global warming. Uh, because the recent ICC, the recent report that came out, all the news headlines were like, oh, we're screwed, the end is near, we cannot, we can't stop things. That's not what the report says. The report says we have to stop our emissions and change our ways. Um, and we can do that. We can change things. All right, I'll stop there. Thank you so much for your patience and uh, for the time to speak. Nisha, thank you so much. That was just amazing. Whoa, everyone unmute and just give a big round of applause. <laughs> Hello. Yay. Um, really, completely, completely inspirational. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And a wonderful way to start this um, symposium. So I really appreciate your words and thoughts and concerns and hopes that were expressed so beautifully. Um, thanks very much. Um, so in this in this symposium, as I said earlier, for those of you who are joining us, welcome. Um, we are moving between the different panelists and we will be holding questions till the end when um, we hope that all of you will either ask to be, uh, you know, uh, answer questions, to, to ask your own questions or to put them in the chat. And we'll be watching for your questions in the chat as well as leading a discussion amongst all the presenters. So again, thank you, Misha. And um, we're gonna move on then to uh, our next esteemed panelist. Um, and the next panelist is, uh, is Eva Davidova. And um, so welcome Eva, hi. Thank you, Kathy. Um, Kathy, thank how you. are you? Oh, great. Thank you, how are you? So I'm gonna read a, a, again, some biographical information about Eva so you have a little bit of background as to um, who she is, although none of these biographies do justice to the people as you can see. So anyway, Eva is an interdisciplinary artist with focus on media, new media information, new media's information and their socio-political implications. The issues of her work, ecological disaster, interdependence and ma manipulation of information emerge as paradoxes rather than assumptions in an almost fairy tale fashion. Davidova has exhibited at the Bronx Museum, the UVP at Everson Museum, the Albright Knox Museum, MACBA Barcelona, CAA Seville, uh, Instituto uh, Cervantes, Sofia, La Regenta, uh, the Circulo de Bellas Artes, um, Madrid, and many other places. Um, her most recent exhibitions uh, are uh, Global Mode at Issue Project Room, which is online. Um, the Sound of One Computer Thinking, which was at the Impact Festival in Utrecht, Netherlands, which is actually where we were lucky enough to meet. Um, and intentions, uh, transfer and disappearance to, or who owns our emotions at the Edge Cut series. She's a fellow uh, and has been a fellow of Residency Unlimited, Harvest Works TIP program, Alfred IEA, and is currently a new member of New Inc, the New Museum Incubator. So with that, we completely welcome you here, Eva, and look forward to hearing um, your thoughts and and more about your work. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Kathy. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you, Misha, for the inspiration. And thank you for everybody who is here today. And I want to also thank to the ancestors and the people oppressed and uh, taken out from uh, their land. I'm currently in Brooklyn, seated uh, on Lenape land. Um, without further ado, I'll start and um, hopefully show you some of the work last year. Playing with the paradox, 
I imagine us as being built by our descendants, human or cyber, and pose a question. If we are the games our children will program one day, can we influence the code they're writing? Can we pull the genes of another reality into this one? I work with performance and the absurd uncertainty and play as I think this have power to produce generative clashes between concepts and stop the inertia of our beliefs, beliefs and actions. The political is as based on desire and fantasy as on the seemingly rational thoughts. I'm interested in the political implications of technology and the slippery issues about, around empathy and the outsourcing of cruelty. Building digital future is indistinguishable from building a physical reality and turning oppressive technologies upside down is possible through non-hierarchical participation, the visceral, the non-dualistic and the paradoxical realms. I think of data and its mixture with the, our bodies as a clear sign of the permeability of the material world. Data is real and omnipresent, but not inescapably true. We are not only transmitters of it, we put it in, spin it in motion. A download of us is happening in the digital space and maybe a erasure. Who are the people who are being erased? And above all, what can be done to counteract these erasures? A space and a body made by data are continuously uncertain. And by entangling its bits with those of the body, a space can become a person and in a sense, give their information away. We're enraptured, extracted, excluded, or erased. Our bodies and actions are transferred and subsequently manipulated, not by some evil AI, but by the fabric itself of our public space and the political structures that put above everything shareholders profit and do so using the public resources to extract ever growing power. What is helping immensely to this transfer and disappearance is the outstanding work of simulation of and engagement with human emotions. I'm interested how emotion-centered technology and simulated empathy produces a kind of mental soil and green for feedback loops of adjusting identities and behaviors. Nora Khan says, designers of technology love to propagate the myth of a just world in which people always get what they deserve. In erasing the messier and unsolvable elements of social experience that shape subjecthood, technology attempts to frame us as clean and uncomplicated. We become reducible, mapped by a programmable sets of tra traits with defined singular meanings. Our digital choices and consumption patterns give a portrait of who we are. We are easily represented by our avatars. Intentions, Transfer and Disappearance 2, which is an animation, an interactive public space installation and a performance with multitude of layers of interactions, explores the failure in identity representation as a possible means of protest and the profoundly false publicness of public space.
Another project I would like to talk about is a years long, already five or more years long project called Global Mode, which encompasses several different uh, um, manifestations. One of them a virtual reality animations and then immersive interactive installations. Global Mode explores the emergence of non-dualistic ancestral realities in the folds of incipient technologies and the possibility to use the visceral, the absurd and the subconscious to imagine and enact multiple presents, not only futures, but presents. Since the start of my project Global Mode in 2015, I have increasingly worked with the mixture of human bodies with those of animals. Baffled by the depth of recurring monstrosities and the ways in which they are further propagated by the broken links between our mental positions and our actual behaviors, I force our connections to these monstrosities and explore the ramifications of our actions. Bird's birth is a visceral image of my role in ecological disaster. Global Mode, Narcissus and Drowning Animals explores ecological disaster, cruelty and manipulation of information through the mixture of an interactive mythology-based VR scene and a projection in the physical and projection or a, a immersive print installation in the physical space around. And certain somehow absurd roles crisscross between viewers virtual 3D animals and a performer from the past. This work had two iterations and there were both site specific made for the space where they will be exhibited. So in both cases, the viewer found themselves immersed in the same space with layers of um, in, uh, animals, others, uh, performers from the past and uh, additional.
For this uh, VR work, I'm extremely grateful to Mathieu Digant, who is in the public today, and to all the performers and all the people who made it possible with very, very little resources. We also wanted it to be uh, flowing back and forth between the digital and the physical. So in the space where it was shown, both at Shoestring in New York, at Impact and in Miami, uh, I included digital um, prints in anamorphic uh, positions that will get back this connection with the virtual. I think it's crucial to reclaim the power of VR in order to invent new actions. I'm interested in the use of VR in a direction away from defined outcome or reproduction of reality. We can act in the virtual, mixing the rules of different games and inventing new ones, forcing us to question each and every one of these rules while still playing and letting go judgment, but not justice. The most recent iteration of Global Mode or the most recent work part of the Global Mode project at large was an experimental participatory performance uh, made for issue project room in which again, multitude of people participated. It was, um, uh, develop, the interactions were developed by Danielle McFatter, the sound was by Matthew Digant, and uh, between Issue Project from Harvest Works and uh, many other collaborators, we managed to do not only an experiment in new technology during the pandemic, but an experiment of collaboration online. Using three pseudo mythological stories as um, three different scenes in the work Prometheus herding Pegasus, Narcissus and drowning animals, and Cassandra law witness objects. We made a participatory performance in which every one of the people online could not only participate and move things themselves, but also feel the movement of others, although they were far away. The performer MX Oops brought his incredible talent to the scene. The avatar of Heather Moravitz and the performer Nietzsche Diaby fighting with helicopters. I'll show you just a very short two minutes presentation of it. Thank <laughs> you. 
In the last year, I have been experimenting with different spaces and wanted to find how scale and relationship with the public can uh, determine the kind of movement and kind of interactions uh, that are possible in this space. Uh, I do think that I, I do think that the immersiveness of the or the possibility to be inside and out outside of a work and uh, see um, different interactions being made by different people by moving in completely unexpected ways make the work make the work more uh, layered. And uh, one of the things I'm really interested in is uh, the augmentation of not only vision, but concepts and, and uh, ways of being, ways of moving and ways of acting. Uh, seemingly disparate discourses can be woven together and seemingly excluding um, excluding ideas can be put together through common movement and action. As I mentioned, part of my practice is to put uh, different uh, people and ideas together. And in my recent show at the Instituto Cervantes in New York, um, I invited three additional artists to participate. One of them was Mark Ramos, whose work you can see in um, the photo on the right. And he, he invited another eight artists to participate and to um, occupy the Wi-Fi space of the Instituto Cervantes. There were four routers, which each offered a different, um, uh, different set of artists. In abundance, Caribbean diaspora, deep faking it, and it's intersectional feminism. If you are in New York, please do come see it. I'm gonna hit record. Should I redo the record. Wi Fi segment? Yeah. That's good. Right. Oh, is it okay that it was already there? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sure. Another contributing artist was Janet Biggs with her video, Step on the Sun. 
and um, Juan Cortez from Studio Tractor Hobbes. I still don't have documentation of his piece. The opening was just a few days ago. And the last video I'm going to show you is called Garden for um, Drowning Descendant or Chimeras. And it was done with motion capture from uh, Kristen McNally, uh, a choreographer and a dancer from the Royal Ballet of London, um, scan of this Cheng, and poem by Zivka Baltadjeva. La realidad se agota tan rápido que para respirar, imagina. La realidad se agota tan rápido que para respirar, imagina. La realidad se agota tan rápido que para respirar. La realidad se agota tan rápido que para respirar, imagina. La realidad se agota tan rápido que para respirar, imagina. La realidad se agota tan rápido que para respirar, imagina. La realidad se agota tan rápido que para respirar, imagina. La realidad se agota tan rápido que para respirar, imagina. La realidad se agota tan rápido que para respirar, imagina. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. That was really inspiring as well. This is such a rich collection of you all, of all these artists who are here. And we were really inspired by your work. Um, Matthew actually just posted the location of this exhibition. Congratulations on the opening. It looks really amazing. Thank I, hope you. we can all, I hope we can all get there. And I love the collaborative aspects of your work. It's so beautiful and so uh, incredible the way these works are bringing in all these different voices and all these different people together. Thank, so you, thank you, Kathy. Thank you, thank yeah. you everyone. Thanks. Um, so we will move now from our, to our last participant, who we're very happy to have here with us is Amy Youngs. And um, I'm also really happy to see Amy. Amy and I have known each other um, through the FEM meeting, which is an auspicious group of, and gathering and network of women in science, art, and technology. And so it's great to have you in this platform too, Amy. Um, so I'm gonna uh, read your biographical information to give a little context. Um, Amy Youngs creates biological art, interactive sculptures and digital media works that explore interdependencies between technology, plants and animals. Her practice-based research involves entanglements with the non-human, 
constructing ecosystems and seeing through the eyes of machines. She has created installations that amplify the sounds and movements of living worms, indoor ecosystems that grow edible plants, a multi-channel interactive video sculpture for a science museum, and community-based participatory video, social media, and public webcam projects. Um, as well, she's made a museum um, of and for insects and many, many other things. So we really welcome you and thank you for participating today, Amy. Looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm gonna try to share my screen here. <clears throat> Fabulous. So um, upgrading your human reality. Um, and the upgrade that I'm proposing is one that I think is not necessarily needed for all humans, but for most of us who are embedded in Western humanity. And what I'm thinking is that we need a recognition, a kind of a coming to terms with the fact that we are not the center of the universe or of the world. So my questions, here are, can art plus augmented technologies help us develop more complex relationships with our non-human kin? Can it assist us in the uncomfortable recognition of our human vulnerabilities? Can we use it as a tool that reminds us to practice more respectful ways of interacting within our biosphere? So the world exceeds us. And my own inflated sense of self was diminished when I was working at the Exploratorium, which is a museum of science, art, and human perception in San Francisco. There, I learned about the vast spectrum of electromagnetic waves, gamma rays, infrared rays, and beyond, and about how we puny humans could only see a tiny sliver of that. Some animals and insects can see more of this spectrum than we can. And at the Exploratorium, I also learned about artists who could evoke full-bodied immersive experiences, even without much technology. And these evoked feelings of wonder and care towards this vast world that I could only partially know. So this um, light painting was created by an artist named Bob Miller in the 70s. Um, and he used a sun tracking mirror to detect the, to direct sunlight from a hole in the ceiling of the museum into prisms and onto reflective mylar. You probably know that you have a blind spot in each eye and it's the place where the optic nerve bundles gather and pucker up on your retina. That's the light detecting film at the back of your eyeball. You can see this dot in the retinal scan in the upper right, but our blind spots don't really end there. The actual design of our eyes are flawed in another way. Um, we, we have these networks of blood vessels that we always see, but we actually never notice. And one way to notice them is to shine a light on the side of your eyeball, which would cast um, the light from an unexpected angle and reveal the shapes of your blood vessels to you. Your brain normally edits these out and actually fills in the cracks with guesses about what is there. The Western cultural tradition also has blind spots and feminist philosopher Val Plumwood tells us that the logic of domination and the deep structures of dualism create blind spots in the dominant culture's understanding of its relationship to the biosphere. Understandings which deny dependency and community to an even greater degree than in the case of human society. Our traditional philosophies have caused us to imagine that we're the heroes, we're the pinnacle of life, and the rest of the natural world is the inferior stuff we get to exploit. Notice in the left side of the graphic that the woman-shaped form is below the man, and um, working towards greater equality doesn't just mean raising that woman um, to the level of the, of the man. Um, in fact, that's not the upgrade that I'm interested in because it would merely replicate the destructive culture of domination and colonization. And that's the flawed story that prevents us from recognizing ourselves as dependent upon a multi-species world. We're entangled and enmeshed in this web of life in ways that the simplistic graphic does not convey. 
So the projects I'm sharing here are aimed at envisioning an upgrade that expands our sense of self beyond the hero of life. Um, instead, we gain a sense of self that's interdependent with other beings who are fascinating, they're valuable, they're complex in ways that we barely understand. Um, my interest is in knowing them, sensing them, amplifying them, celebrating them, recognizing that their well being is intimately connected to ours. And so this is done through mediated forms like a webcam that's broadcast to the World Wide Web. And this work, um, is showing us what worms do in real time, but actually in this case, it's a, a time-lapse video, which can augment our senses, giving us a glimmer of what's happening far outside of our perception. Food, oxygen, waste processing, and renewal are all coming from these non-human kin. However obvious this fact might seem, it's hidden in a culture where food appears magically in grocery stores, air is scrubbed by machine purifiers, and our waste disappears into trash bins that magically empty. In this handshake with composting worms, I wanted to feel vulnerable and to recognize myself as being part of an ecosystem that includes worms, mites, bacteria, fungi, people, cameras, internet, and dirt. A handshake is a ritual of greeting. It's an acknowledgement of equality a ceiling of an agreement, and a demonstration of respect. I held the worms in my hand and I felt the movements of their fleshy, moist bodies fed by the waste generated from my own household. And these worms are actually part of a colony of worms that have been with me for about 30 years. We've lived together in California, Chicago, and now Columbus, Ohio. Living with worms reminds me of the blurry boundaries between food and waste, dirty and clean, decay and renewal. And it reminds me that my human life isn't possible without the work that worms do in association with their symbiotic communities. So my own experiences of living with worms is one of sensing, knowing, and empathizing with non-humans in a locally situated way. And the limitations of this kind of broadcast system though is it can't really duplicate that experience for others. And this is really where interactive technologies are more effective interfaces for introducing us to our earthly partners. So um, this project from 2013 is, is um, about crickets, which is another a kind of a creature that I really enjoyed living with and creating augmented situations for. They're house crickets, uh, the type that you typically find in pet stores. You purchase them for food for your lizards and snakes. Um, and I wondered how I could create an environment for them that they would enjoy and also that would allow humans to appreciate them in a different kind of way. So the scene is entirely a natural looking. Um, it's a kind of protected bubble for them. Um, they wouldn't survive if they were outdoors. And on their bubble is a projected video landscape that they can interact with by chirping. And they make a high pitched sound that humans can't make. So humans can't really interact with the video. Um, um, but they can appear inside this landscape. They're projected on a really small scale inside the bubble. So they sort of join into that world with the crickets. And um, so it's also an installation with another kind of scale shift where uh, there's a closed circuit camera system that captures the small scene inside it. And then it reprojects it at human scale um, in the room so that the insects are larger and closer to our scale, uh, in a sense, kind of augmenting and conflating our worlds together so we can appreciate each other and play. And play, so important. Play makes an opening, play proposes. Donna Haraway writes about these experiences at Play With Dogs and she seriously engages play as an activity with the potential to connect us with our non-human um, friends. Play can transcend language boundaries. It can produce shared meaning and deepen relationships. It allows us to let our guard down and open up to something new. Taking non-human others seriously as partners in a shared world is what's proposed here. So our cell phones now give us a strange new freedom in public space. We can move differently and more importantly, we can choose not to move. 
Our bodies um, can be still in public space as long as we're looking at a phone. The game Pokemon Go brought people outdoors and while I don't really play the game myself, I do recognize it's done wonders to sort of normalize behavior that would otherwise seem odd. And I ask what else can we do with our bodies outdoors and what else can we know beyond a pantheon of, kind of cartoon monsters? My first experience with cell phone based augmented reality began in 2018 and this project remains unfinished. It involved many students, staff, faculty and units at The Ohio State University. Our aim was to engage or is to engage users in a broader understanding of the value of trees, one that includes the aesthetic, scientific, psychological, cultural and personal among the economic. It was designed to function as an engaging interface between the real world, the actual trees on campus, um, a potential future, the virtual tree canopy representing the promise made by the university's sustainability report and multiple other kinds of data. We felt that this research would generate productive conversations across, across disciplines about how data is experienced and how trees are valued. Um, and it really has done that, even though the project's unfinished. I did learn a lot about the sort of normative nature of working with these tools and the underlying structures of the game unit engine called Unity, which is pretty hierarchical and it's full of friction um, when one tries to work in opposition to the framework of a first person hero. And the students actually ended up referring to this um, project as the Pokemon Go for trees. And the computer scientist who worked with me on this was criticizing it as all over the place and it really is and um, well it will be if it ever gets completed I, I think that misusing these tools by trying to include qualitative data like the poems drawings music and stories that could be uploaded by users proved very difficult while um, putting the monetary values on trees or tree objects as they're referred to in the game engine has been much easier to achieve Well, the tools of AR and VR and this format of first person hero style gaming offers a lot of friction towards my own aims. I do have the words of Donna Haraway, um, as Misha does as well, guiding me to stay with the trouble. I, I really wanted to use these immersive technologies to be attentive to the entangled multi species stories of a place. I did a residency at Flushing Meadows Corona Park in New York, which resulted in two experiential artworks designed to focus attention on the non-humans there by engaging the bodies of the human participants. Flushing Meadows Corona Park is a freshwater wetland in New York City whose history includes layers of trash dumping, landfilling, water re-engineering, and paving to accommodate two world's fairs. Resting upon anthropogenic soil and ringed by auto expressways that add harmful effluents, this area around Willow Lake is undergoing restoration. A variety of birds, insects, fungi, and plants live in this public park. Many of the species, such as Phragmites, are called invasive as they thrive due to the conditions fostered by human and machinic activities. After traveling to the site, I could see the effects of my own actions on the place as I saw the shimmering petroleum floating on the water. Creatures move through it anyway, like me, filtering it through our porous bodies. Grasping Permeability is a virtual reality installation that invites viewers to interact with images by grasping them with the controllers in hand. This spatial simulation is made from photographs I took on site. The experience is designed to alter the viewer's sense of self in relation to the hollow virtual skins, the surface representations of place. The ring of Phragmites plants provide a semi-permeable layer that can be touched by real and virtual hands.
So while the virtual experience doesn't really allow for relationships with real things, um, I would say this is also true of nature documentaries, which still do have the power to cause us to physically go to real places to try to see the creatures and scenery that are represented on film. And I'd argue that interactive virtual simulations can take us one step further as they move our bodies inside of and in relation to the representations. A kind of rehearsal for sensing one's own body in relation to a place. So the next project attempts to get the participants' attention focused on the storied worlds of non-humans if they're actually there on site. So here, um, the second project is an AR app uh, that I created that functions similarly to a museum guide, except that it guides you as if you are a creature of the place, like a tree, a bird, a muskrat, a mushroom. Um, and the app leads you to enact these stories of symbiotic entanglements that are taking place there. It's an augmented reality artwork that encourages people to explore and experience ecological networks that are present there in Flushing Meadows Corona Park. So the app also includes mixed reality animations and storytelling as an overlay to the actual park. It's, in, it's designed to be embodied and to connect humans with the unseen worlds that are present there. And instead of inventing a fantasy story, it was really important to me that it be rooted in the reality of the place. So it's a kind of eco-narrative based on the firsthand knowledge of who's there, who's present, the scientific knowledge of them, and the ecological knowledge of the kinds of interactions that they might have. The human is woven into this network of lively creatures who all share symbiotic associations. Um, I also spent uh, a lot of time there, but in addition, relied on iNaturalist. This is a citizen science app that really helped me find out the actual creatures that other people have seen on the site that maybe I missed. And these users can submit geolocated data, um, photographs of plants, insects, fungi, and other animals, which proved very useful. So the app is called Becoming Biodiversity, and it's time so that you land at a stopping point on the trail that relates to the creature that you become. So when you're at the cormorant, you're at the lake diving underwater and chasing the fish, which you would see animated on your screen. And the menu is a kind of a map that shows you where each of the augmented reality scenes take place. So you begin as a plant and you're immersed in your world of chemical communications. There are chemical messages being sent out from our neighbors. These emissions are swirling around and moving into the airspace. Plants may not be able to walk, but we can move beyond our plant body and control the creatures that move around us. Float ahead to where the path splits off. Look for birds. We are transforming into a yellow warbler, a bird that navigates all the way from Central America each spring to nest in this park. How do we do it? We can see magnetic fields. There are chemical methods. And indeed, recent research shows us that migrating birds can see magnetic fields, almost like a heads up display, which is what augmented, augmented reality does for us humans. So we can't see magnetic fields, but the sensors in our phones can. So we can have this augmented bird view of the world simulated for us in our handheld devices. It's kind of like a bird world view overlaid on our own that helps augment our human reality. So this is a screen capture of the scene where that kind of approximates the world of ants. When the pink trail appears on the ground ahead, tap it to lay down scent pheromones that will refresh the trail so the ants coming along later will know that it is still a good one. Take a few steps ahead, then stop and tap again, then again. We want to be sure this trail is here for as long as this food source is, so we can go back for more. After tapping a few pheromones onto the ground, stop and look behind to see if they are there. Use the connection device like an antenna to read the trail we have written. Let's stow the device now and use our sensors to follow the trail ahead. We walk with our six super coordinated legs, able to speed. 
And at the end of each scene, the users are instructed to put their phones away and pay attention, which is ironically the whole point of this app. And my hope is that this type of embodied multi-species story living experience would begin to tune our attention to this expansive more than human world that we live within. And it is available for free on the Android and Apple app stores. And I also like to acknowledge my collaborators, um, Josh Rodenberg, who did the audio, Danielle McBatter programming, and uh, Jane Kennedy, who did 3D modeling and animation for me, and supported by Harvest Works, the Ohio State University, the New York Urban Field Station. Um, so it's great to have all of that help. So how can we regularly practice playing and paying attention to what matters? So this project, Vegetal Entangling, actually arose from an assignment that I gave to my students in an art and science class. It was designed in response to plant blindness, which is a cultural problem that prevents us from recognizing plants around us as important agents in our biosphere. The students were asked to notice and document one encounter with plant once per day and then share their findings at the end of the semester. I did this assignment as well. Um, as our ancestors, plants are more than just food, shelter, and oxygen producers. They've been intimately involved in shaping the human species. They arrived on Earth millions of years before us, and our bodies evolved to interact with them. Our eyes can detect the colors of the ripe fruits, our tongues can taste them, and our fingers are shaped to pluck, shuck, peel, weave, and plant them. Yet, I know so little about their ways of being in our shared world. So this is the art and science class, um, and it's one that I've been co-teaching for many years with the collaborator, Iris Meyer, a molecular geneticist at The Ohio State University. So we start by engaging in science experiments, which really inform the artwork that we create at the end of the semester. Here we're learning how to measure the pores of plants, stomata, which are pictured on the right. These are amazing mouth-like openings that suck in carbon dioxide and exhale oxygen. So the students designed experiments to find out more about why and when these stomata open and close. And we followed the wisdom of indigenous scientist and writer Robin Wall Himmerer, who says, to me, an experiment is kind of a conversation with plants. I have a question for them, but since we don't speak the same language, I can't ask them directly and they won't answer verbally. But plants can be eloquent in their physical responses and behaviors. We also learned about plants from an urban forager, Candace Thompson, who shared her ways of looking at and learning from and appreciating the plants that would just spontaneously grow in cities. We worked together to design and build an art installation that would share our experiences with others. We co-invented a project that allowed everyone to participate. So some students wanted to create virtual reality visualizations of plant cells and others wanted to create physical elements that worked with real plants. This is the final installation called Unbecoming Carbon, Traveling in Intercellular Space. Visitors entered through a giant inflatable stomata to begin their journey as a molecule of carbon dioxide inside a giant leaf. Palisade parenchyma droop from above while the spongy parenchyma and stomata lined the floor. Soft cell structures invited viewers to rest and continue their experience by entering virtual reality. This journey focuses on the incredible processes of carbon sequestration by plants. It's an exploration between the macroverse and microverse that begins in a forest where the viewers take on the role of the carbon particle, being absorbed into a leaf, traveling through intercellular space, and then moving into a cell to become a part of its substance.
So at the end here, visitors are invited to adopt and nurture a living plant propicule to continue its carbon binding work in their own home. Information about how to become a good plant ally is given out here, along with plant awareness posters that were designed for students. So even though you do not get to fully experience this art and science virtual reality installation, I do encourage you to do the class assignment to practice plant noticing because you can increase your sense of belonging in the living world. You can enjoy pleasurable sensations. You can gain a sense of wonder and appreciation for life. You can exercise your perceptual skills and curiosity. You can cultivate gratitude and widen your circle of non-human friends. Here's how to do it. Whenever you feel the urge to look at media on your phone, you point it at a plant instead. So you see the plant through your camera and you notice what you notice. Every day, you take a minute to notice the plant and you practice doing it without your phone camera. And then you look for new plant friends indoors and out. It's that simple. So I hope that these actions can help us learn from our non-human teachers who feed, clothe, and shelter us and when we create immersive technologies, we should remember that we don't need to be the heroes or the conquerors in order to gain a sense of self. We can instead explore and be reminded of that self that is already augmented through our belonging among the incredible kin that we share our earth with. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Amy. That is so great. I, I took screenshots of your assignment, so I'll be able to do it later. It's really the participatory nature of that is really wonderful. And I love that you've given us instructions. So it was beautiful, beautiful presentation. And thank you for bringing all of those uh, kin creatures to the, to the floor and to all of us um, for your work. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so everybody take a big stretch. We're gonna go move into Q and A motion here. Um, I invite you to please list, uh, you know, your questions in the chat and or make a note in the chat that you'd like to ask a question and we'll make sure and put you in the queue. Um, so to start us off though, because everybody's kind of trying to, you know, digest everything from these wonderful artists that we just, we just heard and saw. Um, I'm going to introduce someone who's going to jumpstart us, which is a, a wonderful colleague of ours at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in the arts department, Kate Galloway. And um, I, again, will introduce Kate by reading a little bit of her bio. Um, thanks for joining us, Kate. Um, Kate Galloway is on the faculty at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, where she teaches courses in electronic arts, music, and game studies programs. Her research and, and teaching address sonic responses to environmentalism, sound studies, digital culture and interactive media, and indigenous musical modernities and ecological knowledge. Her monograph, Remix, Reuse, Recycle, Music Media Technologies and Remediating the Environment, explains how and why contemporary artists remix and recycle sounds, music, and texts encoded with environmental knowledge. Her work has been published in American Music, Music Cultures, Tourist Studies, Sound Studies, Feminist Media Histories, and Popular Music, probably among others. So you can see why Kate is gonna be such a great um, uh, respondent, if you will here to start us with our questions. And as I said, please, please everyone jump in with yours in the chat. Thanks very much for joining us, Kate. Thank you, Kathy. And yes, there's so many fruitful ways in which um, these three presentations all intersect with each other, which we anticipated ahead of time. Um, and a lot of different points where we can get started off and um, generate conversation. Um, I was fascinated by the variety of different ways in which their collective work um, is dealing with augmented and virtual realities, engaging with ecologies, environments, assemblages, non-humans, the more than human. Um, and um, it's an area that I've been getting more into reading through because 
particular sectors of environmental humanities and ecomusicology that I traditionally work with in music and sound studies are still really resistant to technology and embracing augmented reality or virtual reality in particular because they value the in situ moment so much. And um, all three of these presentations illustrated the really productive way in which we need to think about new media technologies and how they can negotiate these different worlds, toggle between them, um, and help us imagine possible alternative futures, um, which are particularly important for those who are need to be um, highlighted in these conversations that are coming from, from more marginalized identity groups, um, because historically, speaking about environmental issues and climate change has largely been dominated by white North American and um, Western European voices. Um, but the first question and kind of point that I wanted us all to maybe think about a bit is, is this question of immersion. Um, immersion as a word, as a term, as many in the audience might also um, know, is thrown around a lot, has really infiltrated popular culture. And we talk about immersion a lot without really knowing what it means or really acknowledging the, kind of the nuances of different types of immersion. And I'd like to hear um, how maybe each of you have negotiated this term immersion um, and its actual multiplicity, but also the fact that a lot of maybe our users think they know what it means or they're seeking out these experiences, um, but not really getting down to um, uh, a more productive definition of it or productive use of it. Um, and how maybe we can reclaim immersion for these works because immersive environments and alternative um, environments are really still very valuable for, um, for those who are dealing with feminist issues, are thinking about kind of non-white perspectives on these thematic matter that was presented today, um, but also for marginalized identity groups as well. And so how can we reclaim immersion, um, particularly when we, like I was telling Brenda and Kathy, the most recent use I heard it being perpetuated around an article and advertisement for the Peloton exercise system and talk about immersion and sound and vision for kind of getting into the exercise routine. All right, I guess I'll start that because um, I have been thinking uh, a lot about that. Uh, as somebody who really struggles with the technology myself, uh, and always needs help with, with making it work. Uh, I think about what is really needed. And that's, that's really why I was showing that um, sun painting at the beginning from the 70s. It's sort of like, whatever gets you there, you know, and it could just be a, a framing of the sun and a kind of careful, um, presentation that that is immersive and um, and that also you know we can see that happening in performance and ritual there are so many ways to get to immersive places um, I think that I, I tend to um, try to use as little technology as possible but enough that gets people there um, whatever works to get them there um, but I'm really open to the idea that lower tech is um, maybe the best because it, it's more accessible at that point. Yeah, um, thanks everybody for your presentations and thanks for this question. Um, I agree, I think that, uh, you know, immersion comes from uh, ritual and, and performance and, and, and uh, kind of forms of embodiment and and anyway it's much older it's much older than digital technology um and uh you know jackson two bears has a really good essay about virtual reality he, uh, about virtual reality uh simulations of uh, indigenous longhouses and how virtual reality is kind of actually simulating practices of like being in dialogue with spirits that are not physically present. Um, so I think those, those are other histories to look to. I mean, I think even about in game design, like Salon and Zimmerman talk about social immersion being a really important part of immersion. Um, I think often people think about virtual reality as immersive, but I find put strapping a giant computer to my face to be not very immersive. <laughs> um, yeah. 
And also, you know, uh, you know, when I talk to my students about VR, I try to, um, you know, start with uh, histories of VR that uh, are like panoramic paintings uh, from the 1800s. Um, and to think about how storytelling is immersive. Storytelling is maybe one of the most immersive practices that we have and oldest practices. I totally agree and share and I, every drop of imagination that you share can be immersive. On the other hand, when we talk about immersive technologies, I, I have the feeling that people refer mostly to VR and uh, AR or immersive installation like architectural installations, but uh, for me, we are obviously immersed in technology all the time, everywhere, at any moment. The public space have become one giant immersive technology with intentions. And uh, my interest or my desire is uh, for um, awareness, much bigger participation, kind of pushing back on the intentions that are constantly uh, flowing and manipulating and leading behaviors, um, probably 90, 90% of the time completely subconsciously. So what I feel compelled to bring is uh, participation that doesn't follow the rules, that doesn't belong to the game that can be absurd and seemingly pointless but it opens the possibility that ah there must there could be another layer of um, um, intention that I can or other people can bring that are not the intentions of what is out there of the mm, rampant uh, everything for the money, everything for uh, the gain of very few. Yeah, I was definitely thinking about um, the different ways in which participation plays into each of um, your presentations and the works that you presented in terms of um, instructions, dialogue, um, multi-sensory directions like sound and vision, text, uh, but also um, thinking about um, embodiment and embodiment in the digital or, um, or augmented realities where you're kind of toggling between and simultaneously occupying digital worlds and um, actual worlds um, and how getting kind of getting into those kind of nuances of other sensory parameters um, gives us a more um, a more robust kind of idea of immersion and particularly looking at those, looking at the histories of immersion. And I was thinking also um, in um, Amy's talk about kind of taking us inside um, experiences and inside worlds, like even going back to histories of um, kind of experimental field recording and where you put the microphone inside the bodies of animals that are deceased and capture those kind of sonic machinations as um, Chris Watson does in his uh, vultures work where uh, vultures and flies are feeding on the inside of a carcass of a zebra as a way of kind of taking us into these um, spaces which we cannot sensorily um, occupy and experience as on our own. So the how augmentation um, is also about access. And that was like the second place where I wanted to kind of take a conversation is um, access to experiences of environments, questions of climate change, um, spaces that might be too dangerous for particular bodies or identities or individuals to go, or just that they don't have maybe social economic access to locate those places, to get to those places. Um, I'd like to, I'd love to hear how each of you kind of thinks about access in your work. And this has come up a little bit already, um, access to experience, access to site and subject matter, um, access that's important to have these conversations via art, um, access to technology, of course, too, that's come up with kind of choices that you make in terms of um, devices, uh, code, um, platforms, and so on. Uh, 
Um, yeah, I, uh, let's see, I, th I think about, I used to do a lot of more live performance. <laughs> Um, and then uh, people could only see those things either in the public space I was in or in uh, galleries and museums. So in 2015, when I started making my game Redshift, I decided to make that just like a web-based game so that it would be available to anybody who can access the web. Um, <laughs> I think that made it more accessible, but obviously a lot of people don't have access to computers. A lot of people don't have access to running water. Um, but I think that that's part of the role of museums and galleries is to allow like anybody to walk in and experience those things. So, um, so with my AR work, you know, I partly I chose to use iOS when AR kit came out because I felt like anybody who has a uh, iOS device like an iPad or iPhone then would have some access to the project. Um, but also I showed it in a museum so that people could just walk in and experience it. Um, yeah, that's a pretty boring answer, but there it is. Nothing is boring coming from you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, access seems so obvious at the same time as a need and so overlooked most of the time, both in the creation and uh, um, offering of the work. I uh, recently, someone was telling me, we want to make a human centric technology and I told him, well, to make a human-centric technology, you have to make every being-centered technology, technology that uh, is centered on the environment, on the animals, and of course, on every person, not on the people living in New York or, um, or even just like a 5% of that. So for me, one of the important things of access is who gets to make the technology and big companies have been for decades trying to hide from us how things are made and just to um, make us interact with ready to go projects like uh, uh, but uh, we we can and many 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 artists uh, are doing that in a realm reclaimed the uh, the basic tools like the first directions of coding or the first um, intention of the technologies they're making or using. Yeah, it's a pretty, um, it's a complicated conversation with digital technologies um, because I think, wow, I can have this app that anyone can download load for free and it's in both platforms. It's so accessible, um, but it's really not, you know, and it, and it really is still connected to um, extractive industries and to, to produce phones and digital technologies and the problems with the clouds and the internet, you know, and we could worry ourselves sick about these things. But I do think that, um, doing things anyway, <laughs> trying really hard to make them accessible, trying different ways of making things accessible for people who might not go to galleries or for people who might not fly to a symposium. It's kind of awesome that we can have this online and it can be accessible for folks who don't need to fly. I, I think it's, it's an interesting staying with the trouble um, moment, trying to think through access um, especially with uh, open source software, which I'm super excited about and I always try to use it and then I always fail because, um, you know, I don't have enough programming skills behind me to, to really go there. But, um, but I see it as, you know, like a great speculative future for myself, you know, like I'm going to go there, things will be more accessible and the platforms will be more um, democratic in the future. I'm trying. <laughs> 
Yeah, and I was also thinking about um, choices of using devices that maybe many of our users and audiences are already using for other kind of everyday activities. I know a lot of the Indigenous game designers that I um, that I study and work with and kind of my ethnographic work are kind of yeah, turning to um, iPhones, mobile media, devices that may be shared within the household or that they have for other purposes and yet yeah, making them open access and thinking about um, just thinking about access from the get-go and thinking about the many forms it could possibly take, knowing that there's still going to be limitations, but even access as being part of the conversation is um, sometimes like a great starting point because of other instances that we all know of where um, access wasn't considered or um, who has that, what, which platforms and technologies are being used um, and who might be excluded from those, who's behind um, the creation of um, the creation of a particular tool or platform or um, device that we're using um, as we're kind of using maybe everyday devices to uncover these kind of new stories or possible futures um, and um, productive spaces for those who haven't had a voice um, through this work. Um, I wanted to make sure that we have time also for questions. I've got I've got so many, so many notes, um, and I'll probably be following up with each of you individually as I think through them and process more. But I want to make sure that we have time for questions um, from the audience, from um, Kathy and Brenda, anyone really um, to con con continue making these connections as well. Um, so for those in the audience, uh, you can put them in the chat if you, um, we have the ability to kind of unmute people if you would better, better articulate it verbally to us, um, just let us know maybe in the chat or you might have the raise hand function on your end as well um, to kind of get the conversation going, specific questions for individual speakers or um, for everyone. Yes, and Gabriella? Hi, Kat, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, I wanted to uh, ask Misha, uh, it was for me super interesting to hear uh, you talking about this, um, I'm sorry, like um, you're feeding the baby. Um, I wanted to ask you about how, uh, oh, no, can I go after because like I, I'm very distracted right now, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, that's okay. <laughs> Yay, babies. This event just got so much better. Yeah, exactly. You can't just be us talking all the time. <laughs> yes, the baby is welcome to ask questions. Just reopening my chat again. I think Brenda has her hand up. Yes, too. Brenda. Yes. I'm just continuing that discussion of access, which I think is a really good one. I'm just wondering, Misha, you talked about, you know, your ultimate goal as um, using this technology to be for resistance. And the question is, how could we um, expand access that's uh, re-geared from consumption to um, resistance and resilience? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I think that, um, you know, a lot of activists are, are using mobile phones and different kinds of software to organize. Um, I think encrypted encryption has been an important technology like, uh, like the Signal app for encrypted messaging um, to allow people to create groups and organize on the fly um, or organize on these low long term. <laughs> um, but I kind of feel also like, um, I don't know, something about what Amy said, just uh, I feel also like, or what Kate, anyway, what everybody said, that um, we're like, surrounded by these devices that are full of these apps that are designed to be addictive and like very intentionally designed. Like pick up, pick up a book about designing apps and it probably has a chapter on dopamine. Like it's not, it's not, it's not an accident. People are, you know, there's, cl there's a class at Stanford where you can very intentionally learn about the 
neurochemical reward cycle and how to design to make a million bucks. And that is really terrible and ethically immoral and disgusting. So I think that any weird art shit that we're doing on a phone <laughs> is taking people's eyes away from that for a moment um, is an ethical intervention of resistance already and trying to show people some of the stakes behind the devices they're using and you know change people's yes capitalism is goddamn terrible thank you audience members that um i mean i also really was feeling that part of the instructions amy where you were like um look through your phone at a plant <laughs> and gradually over time you can work towards taking away the phone and looking at a plant and um, it, it seems kind of funny on one level, but also sad on another level, and also true and very real on another level of, uh, you know, trying to intervene in these media environments and, uh, you know, pedagogically with students, but also just with the public. I don't know what everybody else thinks about this question about using these tools for resistance. Yeah. Yeah, or just even I was thinking about kind of, yeah, I'll t a kind of behavior modification as a kind of how to kind of use our bodies and engage in the world differently and not necessarily a di digital equivalent, but so many kind of the formative kind of sound walking um, kind of practicing instructions coming out of like Hildegard Westerkamp and Andrew McCartney that are very much based in kind of feminist listening are also thinking about like in the, their instructions often don't talk to the person next to you as you're going on this sound walk. Try to just listen and feel and sense your body in place while you're moving and while you're stationary, but just the ne necessity of needing to instruct the individual or the collective to try not to talk to each other. Maybe like I tell my students like, okay, it's okay if you acknowledge the existence of someone on campus because you recognize them and they wonder why you're just walking by them, ignoring them, that's okay. But we have this compulsion to kind of talk with each other when we're in a group or um, to kind of verbalize our experiences. But um, what happens when we kind of block that off and sense in different ways? And then maybe over time, we learn to kind of hold ourselves and sense, um, sense our environments in different ways by kind of repeating these practices or different ways of being instructed to kind of interact with the location. Yeah, I was uh, really struck with uh, the thinking uh, that Misha brought forward about the algorithm as a kind of method for solving uncertain problems. And then I'm thinking that that also then leads us towards uncertain solutions which is probably what we, what we're, what we need. You know, we need uncertain solutions, and we need more than just one of them. So these ways that maybe the algorithms are reminding us that there are a lot of ways to use algorithms. Maybe not even with technology, but in terms of instructions for living in the world that we could um, try out together and. Um, see what it's like to be in public space in a different way where you're resisting advertising you're trying really hard not to see it or you know we could come up with all number of um, kinds of algorithms that would be just simple instructions for that would give us permission i guess to um, resist in interesting ways together can i jump in here unless eva wants to add anything to that question? Please jump in. <laughs> Do, uh, we have a question from the audience that was direct messages message to me that I will um, jump to and maybe Gabrielle is uh, ready to jump back in too. But um, I just want to add that part of the reason I brought the three of you together for this this forum was because I felt as though I, I don't know, I'm not an expert on VR and AR at all. But I felt like the three of you were really working almost against the norm of what <laughs> those mediums are. And I really appreciate this discussion about both access, but also ways that you're kind of, you've all mentioned it in your talks, like disrupting the ways that this these um, technologies work and adding other kinds of conversations. So I thank you for that. And the question comes from Abigail Simon. And it says that she's interested in the idea that technology exists um, 
that is not human centric isn't the majority of human technology centered on ourselves. So I'll throw that out to you all. Uh, hi, Abigail. I guess this comes from my answer to uh, my friend. Um, I think it's about realizing that human centric means uh, including everything else, that uh, we talk a lot about inter interdependency. Uh, about connections with other species, about uh, all, all the reasons that we should stop feeling as isolated and as uh, centric to the universe as we do. But when time comes to design a technology, most often than not, uh, people tend to study human behavior as we were discussing and how to affect um, our uh, our brains and our behaviors very specifically in very narrow um, paths. I do think that if we look at it from a completely like other perspective, maybe we're turning our backs to our immediate behaviors and seeing uh, the rest, the extension of us all and the connections that run through everything, uh, we can create some completely different, probably much more powerful, more um, playful um, interaction with technology that could help actually solve problems and not only impose behaviors one after another. I would love to see something designed so that the trees, the plants can point their phones towards us. <laughs> yes, me too. And I guess I do get excited about the potential for AI systems to learn about the languages of other creatures that we can't, we can't speak the language of bats, but um, AIs have somehow been able to figure out a little bit about what they're talking amongst each other about. And I think that there are ways in which um, if we were thinking about um, making technologies um, beyond capitalism, and that's really the big problem, right? Like they're, they're all made under capitalist systems. So they serve humans, right? So if we, but if we can look beyond that and think about what can we learn from uh, non-human others, through these AI systems um, and how can we play with them and engage with them in different ways. I, I get excited about that. Sorry, it's just opening up. I closed the chat, opened it up again. Um, Yes, um, and uh, yeah, and also Gabrielle, if you're like not in a position to um, unmute or um, camera on again, feel free to also put your question in the chat as well. Um, that's another way to kind of, um, we can read it out for you. Um, also, um, I also wanted to kind of let the graduate students in the arts colloquium know that this is also a good time to kind of ask any of your questions. You can um, also kind of unmute yourself or put it in the chat or message me directly with your questions that you might've been thinking about over this um, past week since uh, Kathy and I talked to you last week. I have, I have a question that was in direct message to me that I could share. Oh yeah, go ahead, yes. Uh, and maybe everybody can respond, but um, the uh, audience member says that they have a critique of Seed Soul. That one line is we allowed for this to become normal. My question is, who is we? Let's make it clear that it was specifically white people who dictated the systems of capitalism and imperialism and patriarchy be the dominating systems. Likewise, it's large corporations and the white people leading them who are largely responsible for resisting the destruction that climate change will bring us. Not us, the general public's responsibility, and especially not people of color who are most affected by these environment problems caused by systems white people put in place. Let's let that be known, please. Um, 
So that audience member, I don't know if they want to be identified, so I did to say who it was from. Feel free to jump in if you want to say more. But um, I, I think that is a great point to uh, address, which is um, part of what I'm trying to address in Scene Soul in general is that uh, people are, are differentially affected by climate change. Uh, different people in different groups are affected in, to different degrees in different ways. And people are also differently, differentially responsible. Um, and I would agree that uh, largely European people are responsible for colonialism and the colonial world system that has resulted in capitalism. And largely that it is uh, white people leading corporations responsible for most of the polluting and a lot of people in uh, global South countries uh, who have contributed the least to global warming have been the most harmed by like small island nations that are uh, recently put out a coalition federation of small island nations really put out, recently put out a statement that if we do go up to three degrees centigrade with the ocean warming that's predicted a lot of small island nations will disappear countries like the Philippines are very much under threat. Um, but also but some of what I've tried to do in my work is to really resist simple binaries like white people and everyone else and really bring some nuance to these discussions and uh you know in redshift i was looking at how i as a trans woman of color a latina trans woman uh, a colombian american am, have also have participated in colonialism and climate change uh and i mean even me and my family my family Birth family is Colombian and Venezuelan. Most of them don't care about climate change. They're not doing anything about it, except for contributing to it. My extended family is Mexican and Filipino. And uh, they also probably would tell you that climate change doesn't exist and nobody cares. And uh, they just, it's perfectly fine to drive their SUVs. So I think some nuance is necessary. A lot of world leaders have contributed to the current system that we have with climate change including world leaders from Latin America, <laughs> including people like Bolsonaro, uh, who is not white, who is a Brazilian person. Uh, and so I think some nuance is necessary. I think it's important to understand how people are differentially responsible and differentially affected. Absolutely. Thank you for that. I just wanted to add, uh, I was reading a few months ago a book called uh, The Years of um, uh, Rice and um, Water uh, by Ken Stanley Robinson. And in it, uh, the scenario is that during the, uh, uh, the plague, all Europe and a lot of Middle East is completely smitten, like there are no survivors from Europe. And history goes on from there. And unfortunately, the, the system of exploitation and capitalism still arises. It deploys differently by different people. But I do think uh, it is fundamental to watch the systems and to watch exploitation and relationships of uh, domination. And obviously the current situation as Misha said is what it is, but no matter what is the race of the, uh, of the people we do have to be all the time on the watch on how the system is being made to exploit some and to leave many in um, complete misery. I was just scroll scrolling up in my chat to get um, to a question. We have a um, we've got a question from um, from one of the graduate students, um, Ali Wist. Um, and, uh, and then I see we have another question, so I'll just copy and paste this so I have it handy in my notepad. Um, and Ali's question um, uh, probably applies in different ways to all of you, but also um, she wrote it specifically um, thinking about 
Nisha's work, um, and particularly because she was considering dystopian utopian narratives. Um, Ali says directly that her own work has been criticized as being dystopian simply because it tells stories about possible futures that we view it as undesirable. Um, how, do you, how do you challenge the notions of futures we, we in quotes, um, want? Um, uh, is, um, is your work categorized as dystopian um, when utopian futures are so often exclusionary and disillusional? Um, is dystopian so bad? Um, with her stories about having to move to the ocean for refuge or other narratives about resettlement, um, Ali wonders what role hope or utopia plays within those stories. Thanks. Yeah, what a great question. Um, uh, I, I, I do. Um, I think that a mix of dystopian and utopian is necessary. <laughs> uh, and, you know, dystopian views of like the fall of society could be really utopian <laughs> uh, in certain ways. Um, I think that uh, with Sin Sol, I was uh, I was largely writing about this experience of living through this climate event of of the smoke storm from the wildfires. So two weeks of really just dark skies and no sun. And um, I do think that mostly seen soul is a bummer. <laughs> um, it's 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 a lot of staying with the effect of feeling sad and overwhelmed. Um, but I also tried in there to depict finding moments of freedom or beauty or liberation, even if they're small moments. Um, and I think that with my next project, Oceanic, uh, where I'm making an AR project about the ocean, thinking about uh, sea level rise and ocean acidification, that um, you know something that's come up in talking to climate scientists this time is they're like, you know, we can't just shovel, bury people under mountains of bad news because literally the result is that then they walk out of the classroom, you know, not wanting to live. Um, and that's a, that's a real reality for people. And so uh, this one climate scientist here in our ecology and conservation department does like a bright spots film festival of like trying to focus on solutions because um, there are solutions that exist a lot of them you know even if they're at a small, small scale um, that professor I think his name is Don Noel um, his whole research is focused on relocating coastal bird species uh, inland so that they can keep surviving as the sea levels rise um, and you know there's small solutions that we can focus on so um, I think that I'm trying to be a little more positive in my next piece and not too dystopian. Um, I, what do other folks think about this utopian or dystopian approaches? I agree with a lot of what you said. And, um, and then just to add, I guess that um, you know, this idea that we are, or, or that there was some kind of utopia here for us white people at some point is just to dismiss the fact that there is a dystopia for all of these other living creatures that we're exploiting and other countries and other people that in a way we've outsourced the dystopia. Um, so we don't see it. And I think that that's one of the things that I was really appreciating looking at Eva's work. I was like, oh, this is all coming together. And, and also Misha's too, that like those things are crashing together in a way that you can't really, um, you can't ignore, you know, there, it's not just that everything is doom and gloom. Like there's some exciting things happening and dizzying yet exciting things that are happening when um, these fields are, coming together uh, in, in both of your works. So I, I, I think it's an exciting time to think about how media can, um, can get us uh, working within the complexities of those things rather than thinking about um, the simple 
uh, Hollywood version of what, what the future is, which is what we're working against really. Um, can I, I, I just want to add something. Um, yeah, I, what, what Amy said also makes me think of, about just again, in response to this question, I think that nuance is the answer. <laughs> nuance is the thing that I really strive for in my artwork and in my thinking that I think is really important. I think that um, there's a danger, there's a da real danger in utopian thinking. Um, and it's like the similar danger of like romanticizing pre-colonial times romanticizing indigenous people in general. Like indigenous people also had slaves. Things, there were also problems. There was also homophobia in indigenous cultures before colonization. Not all of them, some, they're very, there are many, many, many different indigenous cultures. So, you know, I try to avoid generalizing about races like white people and people of color. People of color also do things that are not so great sometimes. Um, and so I think that good storytelling also involves not just being purely utopian or purely dystopian. That was just great. I just took like a slew of notes down that probably make no sense. I'll decode my notebook later. Um, <laughs> uh, and oh, I've got Bibiana's updated question. Um, okay. Uh, so their question, expanding on their previous question, um, all of the works presented today required collaborative collaboration and skill sharing. In what ways do these already build futures of art making or not? Can I add to that, Kate? Yes, you can. I wasn't sure how, my classes had terrible internet to when we've had to meet online. So I was just like, use the chat if you want to, but also, Speak up if you want to. <laughs> yeah, uh, okay. yeah, I'll try to must I'll try to put it together in person. So it, it adds to the first, which I don't think you read yet, which was mostly directed at Eva. And I was thinking about the end of her presentation, uh, when the kind of the inclusion of other artists in exhibitions uh, was uh, brought up. And so then I was thinking, what role does collaboration and curation of other artists support uh, the objectives of the work, right, or of the art practice? But then uh, to make it kind of more broad for all the panelists, I was thinking, well, all of these projects are kind of big. They all have collaborators uh, to bring in other skill sets. So <clears throat> in what ways is all, and also I noticed that everybody's crediting their collaborators, which is not necessarily the case when you go see bigger installations in museums. Sometimes they're credited, but it's not, not everyone's doing it as a, as a form yet. So I'm thinking in uh, what ways are these collaborative <clears throat> work modes and um, practices and or then a curatorial aspects of it um, in what ways are these sort of building these futures or are they or are we not even thinking about that like does that make sense yeah definitely yeah you're definitely this first part of your question scrolled past me so that thank you for bringing for connecting the two uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I think it has so many layers. One of them is pure desire to, um, to be with people I admire and to work with them and to make uh, things together. Another one is uh, a principle that I do think that against the individualistic culture, um, we have been brought up in for decades and centuries uh, intentional uh, inclusion, although chaotic many times in my, in my case, because I don't really have a plan for years how to, to do that, but I do um, think it has to be both intentional and organic and to work with people always. I mean, my mind is not my own only. I'm influenced by all of you. I'm influenced by so many things. So to give manifestation to this is also kind of one of the layers of um, working with others, of uh, including works by others and so on. 
and I love curating. If I was a good writer, I would be curating more, <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, I do what I can. I, I also really appreciate the question um, because I think that it is a part of like prototyping futures that we want to try to live in. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I'm experimenting with different ways of collaborating, sometimes just with the people who show up in class <laughs> and uh, the scientists that I co-teach with. And that's um, been interesting rather than kind of thinking about it as the professors are directing this project, we, we try to make it really clear that we don't know what we're doing and we're all gonna figure it out together and we're all gonna be equally credited as the artists here, you know? So that's, you know, it's, it's what it's the future I want to live in, and it is a messy one yet, and sometimes um, creates other kinds of friction where students still expect me to direct the project, and that's a challenge. I don't really want to direct the project, and um, and then other projects where I've uh, been more like the director, and then you know with these programmers, and it that doesn't. That's just not as fun for me, honestly. I mean, it's it's interesting and the project gets done faster, but I am actually really interested in this question of how do we use these collaborative forms differently? Um, how do we credit them properly so that we're recognizing all of the labor that goes into this kind of work? Um, and I don't really have the answers for it, but I like um, playing in that messy zone right now. Can I just jump in for a second? I think we're coming kind of to a little bit of a, a conclusion in that people are needing to take bio breaks. So, um, you know, maybe just one or two more questions. I know we have one question in the chat, which we I think is for Amy, is um, magnetic field, is that magnetic field technology, um, can it be downloaded onto any iPhone is the question. Okay, so it's um, any any phone, any cell phone actually already has a magnetic sensor in it. And so the app actually, um, uh, it works uh, by using the existing sensor that, it, that are already in phones. Um, and the app simulates it in my kind of like uh, artistic um, rendition of what I imagine that it would be, which isn't probably anything like what, what a bird really sees. And that was a, a struggle to just be like, I have no idea what that looks like to a bird. So I'm gonna have to imagine it as an artist and then translate it. Uh, but it definitely works on the magnetic sensor of the phone, which is kind of fun to think about. Like We already have this sensor in our phone. <laughs> and so that's just like one of the scenes that would be um, an augmented reality that you would get to have if you were a different creature in becoming biodiversity. Sorry, I had to step away. Uh, are we still talking about the collaboration question? Yes, okay, cool. Um, I could take a bit about it. Um, yeah, I mean, I love collaborating. It's like my main mode of working. Um, uh, largely because uh, I have ADD, so uh, ADHD. So I'm not so good at like, I'm just gonna sit down and like write code for 10 hours or I don't know, write a story for an hour even. <laughs> um, but I do function much better in dialogue and conversation with people. Um, and also because, um, I mean, it was really life-changing for me to be a, a grad student at UC San Diego. And my advisor, Ricardo Dominguez, invited me to work with the Electronic Disturbance Theater as a named collaborator and not as an employee. I mean, I worked with other faculty there who I was literally like a, an employee for. <laughs> um, and uh, with the Electronic Disturbance Theater, it was... Uh, you know, I was able to contribute to ideas to the project and um, be part of the performances and all that. So it was uh, it was really amazing for me. Um, so I try to do the same or similar for my students uh, and and other faculty that I work with. You know, to make sure that everybody's named when the project is presented and 
um, yeah, to try to have some shared decision making. Yeah, I love the comment that just came up in the in the chat about how, just not thinking about yeah our interpersonal collaborations and actually making a project project happening, but also thinking about yeah the interdependence that um, we have on kind of non-human populations and kind of thinking about ecological and ecosystem theory as applied to kind of project development too. And so yeah, the wide ways we can think about participation and collaboration and just like we don't all have the same skill sets or we need to develop particular skill sets, um, but also collaboration as a space to kind of bring other voices in or bring people up in the ranks that need certain exposures or skill training or um, to augment um, their voices and perspectives so that the stories we're telling also have these kind of multivalent um, resonances. Thank you. Does anybody have anything else they want to jump in with? I think that's a really beautiful place to end. And um, so last chance for questions, jump in, put them in the chat. And if not, then let's just give everyone a really big shout out for their amazing participation in this event. We thank you. Kate for leading this discussion and all of you for your sharing your works, sharing your ideas with us. We hope that this will continue. Um, we have some other events coming up, which I just put in, put these, um, I'm put these in the chat that are um, a likewise amazing uh, artists and people who are coming to um, this Zoom forum, which I know we're all getting tired of someday it will end but it's a nice way to bring people from far, afar together. So we have a conference um, called Ruderal Ecologies, which is happening the weekend of the 20, 22nd to 24th of October. And it has some amazing scholars and thinkers and artists who are joining us. So please check that out. There's a, a link in the chat. Also, we have Tony Cox is coming to an MPAC I Year Presents event also. That's at the end of October, October 29th. And uh, Tony is an amazing artist. If you have not seen his work, please, please join us for that. And then one final I Year Presents a new Sanctuary event um, called a film called Not Going Quietly, um, which is by Nicholas Brackman on um, disabilities rights. So these are really strong events and um, we're looking forward to those. And we really also deeply in debt to impact for helping us sponsor this event and to all of you for being participants so thank you so much for joining us today we really appreciate everybody's time and brilliance thank you so much thank, thank you. you thank you thank so you. much thank you, and all the organizers thank you it was really fun thanks sure have a great day everybody this, this will be re this recording will go up on the impact uh, website uh, soon ish okay. so you'll be able to catch what you had to miss during the bio breaks <laughs> go back and thanks all. thank you thank, thank you everyone bye bye, bye.